Gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you again tonight, Lord, praising you. We just thank you so much to be uh, back out again to hear your word proclaimed and to sing praises unto you, Lord. And we thank you so much for the blessings in our lives and the blessings that you have in store for us when we get to heaven, Lord. And what a gracious and a beautiful day that's going to be, Lord. And we pray tonight, Father, for those that we just mentioned by name. We pray for traveling mercies, for uh, Greg and Michelle coming home, and uh, for Lori getting ready to go to Texas. Lord, we just pray that you keep them safe on their journeys and uh, get them home safely, Father, when their traveling is done. And Father, we pray for the family of Kathy Underwood, who, uh, Lord, she went home to be with you this morning. So, Father, we pray for her family, that you'll just bless them and uh, bring them peace, comfort, and strength as well. Be with us tonight. 
Father, as we uh, uh, sing your praises. And be with me as I bring the message you put on my heart to touch the hearts of the hearers this evening, Lord. We love you and we praise you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Stay close, number forty five. I am just a weary pilgrim, through this world of sin, getting ready for that city. Now when the saints go marching in, when the saints go marching in, when the saints go marching in, Lord, I want to be in that number, when the saints go marching in. Up there I'll see the Savior, who redeemed my soul from sin. With extended hands he'll greet me when the saints go marching in. When the saints go marching in. When the saints go marching in. Lord, I want to be in that number. When the saints go marching I'm satisfied with just a cottage below, a little silver and a little gold. But in that city where the ransom will shine, I want a gold one. That silver line, I got a mansion just over the hills top in that bright land where we'll never grow. And someday yonder, we will never more wander. But walk the streets that are pure as gold. Don't think me poor, deserted or lonely. I'm not discouraged, I'm heaven bound. I'm just a pilgrim. In search of a city, I want a mansion, a heart of the crown. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop, in that bright land where we'll never grow. And someday yonder, we will never more wander, but walk the streets that are purest gold. Mr. Smalley. 
I have found a friend in Jesus, he's everything to me. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. The glory of the valley, in him alone I see. All I need to plant and make me grow in sorrow he's my comfort, in trouble he's my strength. He tells me every care of him to roll. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. He will never, ever leave me, nor yet forsake me, dear. While I live by faith and do His blessed will. Oh, all of fire about me, I've nothing now to fear. With His hand I keep, my hungry soul shall fill. Then sweeping up to glory to see His blessed face. Where rivers of delight shall ever roll. He's a lily of the valley, the bright morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. <laughs> Uh, one and one. One and one is little bird. Power in the blood. That reads a little bit. To be free from the burden of sin. Well, there's power in the blood. Oh, there's power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There is wonderful power in the blood. Now there is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you serve this for Jesus your King? Well, the power in the blood, the power in the blood. Would you the daily use praises to sing? There is wonderful power in the blood. Power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood? 119. B flat. B flat. Okay. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Trusting in his grace this hour, are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless, are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? 
Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin, and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean, who oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-painting blood of the Lamb? Are you garments spotless, are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? You're singing. You're not singing. You got an audience. There's four people. <laughs> Come on, bro. Kevin, you're singing tonight. You got a solo, right? Well, me and Bubba might do it. Too. That's right. There you go. And Travis Trio will make it. Trio. Yeah. Do a common die. Okay. Common die. What key? Uh, what page number is it? One forty-six. One forty-six. Let me tell you what key that is here shortly, so we get the top of the map. Here you see. Easy enough, right? Jesus has table spread where the saints of God are fed. He invites his chosen people come and die. With his hand I eat a feed, and his lies are every deep. Oh, tis sweet, sup with Jesus all the time. Come and dine, the master calleth, come and dine. You may please the Jesus table all the time. He fed the multitude, turned the water into wine. To the hungry calleth now, come and dine. Take his pride to be ever at his side. All the host of heaven will the symbol be. Oh, will be a glorious sight. All the saints and spotless white. And with Jesus they will feast eternally. Come and die, the master call and come and die. You may feast the Jesus table all the time. He who fed the multitude turned the water into wine. To the hungry call it now, come and die. Yeah, you got one tonight. Nancy. Uh-uh. <laughs> Nancy. Uh-uh. Come on now. Uh-uh. You don't want to hear that. <laughs> Does anybody want to come see Bubba and Travis? Come on, Charlie, come on up here. She is brother. All right, you will come with her. There you go. What about the other two girls? You want your friends with you? Come on. Come on. Sure. <clears throat> you gonna share this, or do I gotta go get another one? We, can, we all can see it. All right. <laughs> all right. All right. All right. Ready? I'm oh, sorry. Yep. Ready. That's your introduction. That's <laughs> 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 Some bad morning when we slap the door. Fly away. Oh, fly away. I fly away in the morning when I die. Hallelujah, by and by. I fly away. Just a few more weary days and then I fly away 
to a land where joy shall never end. I'll fly away. I'll fly away, oh glory. Fly away. Now when I die, Good yeah. chorus again. Good chorus one more time. Here, yeah. y'all sing loud. Ready? Say, Oh, I'll fly away, oh, glory. I'll fly away. When I die, hallelujah, by and by. Is that lukewarm uh, water right there? Huh? Is that lukewarm water that you got right there? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Jesus. 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 Thank <laughs> you. 
<laughs> That's a good job. Good job, Katie. Good job. Good job. Thank you. Thank you for coming to do it. Now. That's right. Uh, now we're gonna work on some four-part harmony. <laughs> All right. That that'd be it, Richard. All right. You gonna give me five minutes? Yeah. All right. Can I use all of those? No. <laughs> yeah, all right. All right. Thank you, sir. Lose more water. Uh huh. All right. <clears throat> all right. Well, it's good to see everybody out this evening. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, uh, turn to Second Thessalonians chapter one. This morning I said we're going to talk about some things that go hand in hand. And I'm going to try to get you out of here in relatively uh, sensible time. I don't have a lot of notes, actually. But there are things that go hand in hand in life. You know, we always talk about things that go hand in hand, kind of like peanut butter and jelly, right? Yes. <laughs> peanut butter and jelly do go hand in hand. My wife will tell you at about 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock in the morning, there is some peanut butter and jelly sandwich going on in the kitchen. <laughs> She'll wake up and see me in there making peanut butter and jelly. It goes hand in hand, and it goes hand in hand with me. Um, also, milk and cookies. You don't like milk and cookies. That goes hand in hand, right? Yes. Also, uh, there's some other things that go hand in hand, kind of like pride and destruction. Mm. Um, alcohol and drunkenness. Teenagers and back talk. That goes hand in hand, right? Y'all didn't think it was going to be all milk and cookies, did you? Of course not. There are also things, uh, other things that go hand in hand, especially within our faith. And that's what I want to talk about tonight. As believers in Christ Jesus, there are things that go hand in hand. And actually, uh, Paul spells them out for us if you just pay attention in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. We're going to read the first four, the first four uh, verses opening up. It says, Paul and Silvanus and to, uh, Timotheus. Unto the church of the Thessalonians in God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth. So that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith, and all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. I want to stop there. This is this is Paul's greeting. It's his opening in this letter to the church of Thessalonica. And he gives thanks for them. Praise God. I give thanks for you. I give thanks for the church. I give thanks for all believers. But especially the church that I'm involved with. Uh, because I know you. And it's, this is personal to me. I know each and every one of you. And uh, I know some better than others. But... Um, you know, when I, when I talk to people, um, it's evident of who you are because I hear people that don't go to this church. Sometimes they'll come up to me and they'll say, you know, so-and-so did this and so-and-so. And so most of the time it's good. Okay. But they'll let me know what the church members are doing. You know, I, I've said this before. You don't have to come and tell me what you're doing because other people are going to let me know. And they do. And it's it's a... It makes me smile and it makes my heart warm because I know that the hands and feet, at least in this church, are working. So that's a great thing. And I give thanks for you, just like Paul gives thanks for this church in Thessalonica. And so doing, though, Paul joins together some words of faith that go hand in hand. And I want you to understand uh, it's hard, if not darn near impossible, to have one without the other. Like for me, it's hard to have peanut butter without jelly. There's no jelly. I'm probably not going to eat just a peanut butter sandwich. Yeah, that will uh, that will just stick to the roof of my mouth. I don't like that. So there are things in faith that go hand in hand, and it's pretty much impossible to have one without the other. And we're going to talk about those tonight. Verse two. Paul joins two words together. If you notice, grace and peace. He puts grace and peace together. He says, "Grace unto you and peace." Those two go hand in hand. If you have the grace of God, you inherit the peace of God within you. That's that's evident. It should be self-evident. 
People should see that piece about you. That doesn't mean that you don't get upset from time to time. That doesn't mean that you're not unhappy from time to time, but you have that peace that passes all understanding to know that when we're in the trials and tribulations of this life, and we're in them every day, when we're in those trials and tribulations, we can have the peace that passes all understanding with us because we have God in us, the Holy Spirit, that calms us and gives us that peace. Now, grace is that divine favor of God bestowed upon all who have put, who have called upon the name of the Lord Jesus. And they believe in their heart. We talk about those things. If you confess, you must believe. Because it's not going to do any good just to have lip service. Okay? You must believe in your heart. A lot of people talk to talk but don't walk to walk. And the reason they don't walk to walk is because they're not, they don't really believe what they're saying. And it's evident. You can see that. I can see it. Everybody sees it. I don't really need to harp on it, but I will. <laughs> That's right. Peace, on the other hand, peace means to have quiet, quietness and rest. Quietness and rest. Me and Sarah talk about that all the time. I like, I like quietness and rest. I'm at that stage in my life where I don't like commotion. Now, when I was a younger man, I must have loved it because it was all around me. There was all kinds of commotion around me, but I have... I've learned peace. I've learned patience. I've learned to be calm. Sarah's probably in the other room laughing right now. <laughs> but I have. And we'll talk about the differences in these in a second. But peace means you have that quietness and that rest. If you have the grace of God through salvation and faith in Christ Jesus, then you have the peace of God that passes all understanding residing in you. You'll have eternal salvation. You have eternal salvation by God's grace. And thus, that gives you peace. If you have, if you know you have eternal salvation, that is peace. Uh, I can't explain it any other way than that. Knowing that no matter what goes on around me, no matter what happens in my personal life, or what happens out in town, what happens to my house, my house could blow away tomorrow. And you know what? That does not take away my salvation. It does not. My car, just like when I was in Georgia, and, and, and my, my truck is leaking oil, and it was the worst oil leak I've ever seen. I could have probably made money from all that oil that I was dropping. And Sarah's, she's like biting her fingernails over there because she just thinks I'm going to explode. Richie's about to lose his mind. No, I didn't. Because I've got peace. I've got peace. Because it doesn't matter if the truck blows up. I mean, it would not make me happy. But I got the peace of passes all understanding. I know that no matter what happens to that truck, God's going to take care of me. And one day I'm going to be in heaven with him. And I don't care about that truck. So I don't let those things bother me anymore. Little things bother me. I'll tell you that. I'm working on that. Praise God. God's working on it with me. The little things. The little things. Like people being late. That worst time yet. Uh, I'm, I'm, yeah, I just, no, I'm not talking about that. But when I was in the workforce and you, somebody shows up five minutes late, I used to chat me. You can do something about that. You might not be able to do something about your tire exploding on the highway. I can deal with that. But you being five minutes late for work, but you can do something about that. But that digress. I this is not part of this. I was fixing to get on another ramp, uh, chasing another rabbit there. So we'll stop with that. But So you got grace and peace. One, they both go hand in hand. They go together. You can't have one without the other. If you got God's grace, you have salvation in your heart. You know that you put your trust and faith in Jesus then you have that peace that passes all understanding. Some of us are still babes, and we're still learning, we're still growing, but you should be learning and growing through God's Word. And if you are, then you'll understand that peace. All right, verse 3. Paul puts faith and charity together. We talked a little bit about charity this morning. Faith is growing, and char uh, excuse me, faith is growing, and charity is growing within you. Okay? Faith is your moral conviction. That's what faith is. It's your moral conviction of truth and reliance upon Jesus. For what? For salvation. So that's where that peace comes from. But the faith is that moral conviction of truth. Your reliance. You put your trust and faith, your reliance in Jesus and Jesus alone. And then charity goes hand in hand with that. We talked about a little bit about this. Charity is love in action towards one another. The love in action towards one another. You're supposed to love your neighbor. We talked about that this morning, did we not? When your faith in Jesus grows, your charity grows. Or it should. 
because your love for everybody else should grow. The more you get rooted and founded in your faith in Christ Jesus, the more you understand what your relationship with Jesus is all about and what he has done for you, the more you start expressing that towards other people. It's how we live. It's how we talk. It's how we breathe. It's how we do everything because we are in him and he is in us. So therefore, we have faith. And because we have faith, we have charity. We have that genuine love for one another, not just one another in the body of Christ, but also those that are without. And we should have that. The Bible tells us to have that for all, not who's our neighbor, everybody, not just your real neighbor, your next door neighbor, not just your friends in the church, not just the people that you knew growing up, growing up, but everybody. If you see someone who professes Christ as Savior, but they're hating their neighbor, you're looking at somebody who's not growing in faith. I'm not going to say that they don't, they're not saved, but they're not growing in their faith. They're not going home. They're not praying. They're not studying the word. Because I guarantee you, if you study the word, if you're in the word of God daily, and you take it serious to know him and to know more about him, you'll be a changed person. If you're seeking him. These people that profess Christ as Savior, but they hate their neighbor. I guarantee you they're not praying daily. I guarantee you they're not in the word daily. Because how can you read the word of truth and not abide by it? How can you study the word of truth to know Jesus Christ better, to have a personal relationship with him, and not abide by what he's telling you to do? You know, I told on myself this morning, I talked about that guy at the gas station that I, I, I chirped at because I was tired, I was worn out. He didn't deserve that. But that eats at me. I'm going to share something with you. If the only thing that stands out in your life are all the good things you've done, there's something wrong with you. The things that you have done wrong, the things that you know aren't right, those things should eat away at you. Until you've repented, until you ask forgiveness, until you've taken it to God and laid it at his feet. If you're doing something wrong or you've done something wrong that is against the word of God and it doesn't bother you, there's something wrong. It should bother you. That night it bothered me and it bothered me quickly. You know why? Because the Holy Spirit was convicting me. That's not what he calls us to do. He calls us to love each other. To love. You got to use some discernment. You got to be safe. But you got to love. I guarantee those people that are hating their neighbor, they're not praying, they're not studying God's word, and they're most likely missing worship service on Sundays and Wednesdays because it's not important to them. Your faith should grow, and in turn, your charity will follow. Your love in action will follow. They go hand in hand, period. In verse 4, Paul joins patience with faith. Patience is the word we don't like to talk about. We don't like to talk about that at all. To have patience is to have a cheerful and hopeful waiting with endurance. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go a little bit more in depth with this. Because this is not the patience of you sitting at a, at a red light. That's not what I'm talking That's not what he's talking about. So let's not get it mixed up. My wife likes to point out that I don't have patience. I'm going to tell you a little story. I told, I told Kevin and Becky this the other day at the hospital. <clears throat> but last week I had this brilliant idea that I was going to uh, put some... Uh, um, window tent on my house window because I got this big picture window that's about 500 degrees in July and August. So I read that you can, you can tent this and it will block out 90% of the UV rays. And I'm like, what a genius idea. Let's do that. So I went to Lowe's. I bought this thing. My window is 72 inches wide. I'm working by myself. You can already tell you that this is not going to end well. <laughs> I paid for this. I got it home. I was excited like a kid at Christmas time, right? I'm unwrapping this. Oh, I'm going to do something. It's going to be great. Five minutes into this, I like wrap myself in it. It's, it's like all stuck up. I'm like trying to hold it up with my feet and my knees. And I got the squeegee. I squirted the window. I squirted this. I, nothing. It's all crinkled up. And Sarah, I can just see Sarah just backing up. I'm like, she knows it's fixing to happen. It's coming. 
And I give, I, I might have lasted five minutes wrestling with this. And you ever seen that commercial where the guy was trying to put on a screen door? And, and, and the screen, the sliding screen door, and it didn't work. And about 10 seconds after it wouldn't go on the, rep, the rail, he balls it up and throws it out. Well, that's what happened to that window. Too. I had this much patience with the window. And Sarah's just like, she just sitting there like, oh, that was a waste of money. It's a waste of money is what that was. We have a nice little cool down sunshade now. It works. It works wonders. But that's not the patience that Paul's talking about. Yes, we should practice that kind of patience too. Because what does that do for you? Not that it just gets you mad and wrinkles up some, some expensive window tint. That's what that does. But the patience he's talking about is the endurance of waiting for our Lord. That's the patience he's talking about. Waiting for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And sometimes, and you heard me last week. How long, Lord? Oh, and it's, I could have gone further in the Old Testament with that, but there's several, several prophets that cried out. How long, O oh Lord? But that's what he's talking about here. The patience as we patiently wait for the Lord, because the Lord, God the Father, has perfect time. He's the one that's going to tell God the Son to go. And he's got the perfect time for it. And sometimes we get the little cart in front of the, the horses, and we want we want things now. I want it, I want it now. I'm like I'm like that kid waiting at Christmas time. You know you know. Oh man, I never mind. The kids already never mind. I ain't gonna go. I, I don't want to ruin Christmas for anybody. Let's say your birthday. Let's <laughs> say your birthday. Let's say your birthday. A kid waiting for your birthday, right? And you know your parents got something in the room. You know they got something in the room for you. It's hidden in the closet. And you want it now. But you got to wait. Well, we have to wait. We have to wait for the Lord. We have to wait patiently. But in that patiently waiting period, we have work to do. And that's where it gets hard. That's where it gets hard. Because we have work to do. And sometimes, just like old Jonah... Jonah didn't want to go do what he was told to do because he didn't think those people were worthy. They ain't worthy. I ain't doing it. I'm going to go the other direction. That didn't end so well for Jonah. It's not going to end well for us if we're not obedient. We have to have the patience and endure, but we need to do it with cheerfulness and hopefulness. And what are we hoping for? The Lord Jesus Christ. He is our blessed hope. How can we have this in the face of trials and tribulations in this life? How? Because we have faith. That's what we say. We put our trust and faith in Jesus and Jesus alone. And he that is the moral conviction of truth that we have in us. That we rely upon Jesus for salvation. That is my hope. And that's where our patience comes from. So in other words, we have to have patience in this life because we have salvation from death. And everlasting condemnation. I mean, think about the people who don't have Jesus Christ. Who have not put their trust and faith in Jesus Christ. They don't understand the peace. They don't understand what grace is. They most certainly have no patience in this life. Because what are they waiting for? What is their hope? And that should make you sad. That should make you sad enough to want to go tell somebody. So patience and faith go hand in hand. We're talking about being not being patient at a red light. We're talking about being patient, waiting for our Lord Jesus Christ and the work that we are supposed to do while we are here, patiently waiting. However, if you're at a red light, please wait for it to turn green. That would be the best thing to do. Now I'm transition here to judgment at Christ's coming. I'm going to go on here. Verse 5 says, Which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God. Listen to this, because 5 through 12, the rest of the chapter, this is about judgment that's coming, okay? So we talk about some things going hand in hand that were kind of good for us. I'm going to talk about some things that go hand in hand that might be kind of bad for some others. I'm going to start in verse 4 again, because there's a colon there, so it goes with 5. So it says, so that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith and all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God. 
that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which ye also suffer. Mm. Think about worthy and suffering right there. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense, listen to this, recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he shall come to be glorified in his saints, that's you and me, and to be admired in all of them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Wherefore also we pray always for you, that our God would count you worthy of this calling, and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness, and the work of faith with power. That the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, let me say that again, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you, in ye in him, according to the grace of our God, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we're talking about judgment. We're talking about judgment at Christ's coming. Speaking of judgment, there are some things that go hand in hand. We just talked about some good things in the first four verses that go hand in hand, kind of like milk and cookies. Some of those stuff, that stuff was really, really charming and really good for us. But now there are some opposing factors that go hand in hand that aren't so good. And we're going to talk about those. The rest of chapter one, Paul uses the words that go hand in hand that other people might want to run from, or they might think they can run from. But these things that go hand in hand and the rest of the chapter are what we call dualities. They oppose. They're opposing. It's not like milk and cookies. That doesn't oppose one another. That goes good. But this does not go good. Verse 5, Paul mentions the righteous judgment of God. And some would think that there cannot be a righteous judgment. That's kind of an oxymoron, people would think. That if it's righteous... If God is righteous, how can he judge? I've heard that so many times in my life. If God is a good and righteous God, if he's a loving, righteous God, how can he judge? Because he's a righteous God. Because he has said, he has spoken, and we are to obey. And when we don't obey, he has to hold us accountable for not obeying. Or else everybody would just run amok. Everybody would be building their tower to heaven. Like that idiot Nimrod. We got some Nimrods in the world today. A whole bunch of Nimrods. Cannot be a righteous judgment of God. They're silly. Those people are sadly mistaken. They're misled by people doing the devil's work. There are people in modern churches today that are telling them that God's not going to judge them, that God loves them. I just heard it yesterday. God loves you. He's not going to punish you. He's not just punished. You got people that say they've died and gone to heaven and come back and say, well, God spoke to me and said that he's not going to punish anybody. Smack that. No, don't smack them. That's not patience. Run from that person. If what they're saying doesn't line up with the word of God, they are liars. And that word doesn't come from God. It comes from the pits of hell, from Satan himself. Tell them the truth. And if they will obey the truth, Move on. Move on. But these people aren't just people that are in the pews. There are some of these people that are behind the pulpit. I am saddened by what I've seen in modern churches. And they have huge <clears throat> followings. I'm, I'm going to name some names tonight. And I hope I don't upset nobody, but I'm naming names because I want, the Bible says mark and avoid. Mark and avoid. I'm going to name some names for you. Creflo Dollar. Y'all know Creflo Dollar? He's a uh, young pastor, I guess. He and his wife are pastors now. His wife has become some type of pastor in his church. But they're part of that Word of Faith movement, not the Word of Faith Church in Crescent City. They're part of that Word of Faith movement. They believe that they are gods. And they try to tell their congregation that you can be gods. Crap little dollars straight from the pits of hell. If he doesn't repent, 
he's going there. And he's leading thousands upon thousands. Stephen Perkin. I personally saw him say he was God. Hmm. I saw him say that. And pounded his chest when he did. I am God, is what he said. Now, if anybody just watched this video right now, do not clip that and say that I, that I did that. I'm telling you what he did. Andy Stanley. Andy Stanley has taken this word and has walked all over it. He actually threw his father under the bus. Saying, if you were raised in a family like I was, where you were taught that this is infallible, inerrant, and divinely inspired word of God, then I'm sorry. Because although there are words in here that are inspiring, they're not divinely inspired. And although there are words in here that, that are good and wholesome stories, they're not true. This is a man who has been ordained and been hired by a church to preach to them, and he's telling them lies. Where is your authority? Joe Wolstein, I don't even need to say anymore. I'm going to say another name you're probably going to get mad at me about. Matt Hayden has lost his mind. His son, I don't know. His son, I think, is okay. But I think Matt Hagee has absolutely lost his mind. No, excuse me, John Hagee. Is it the, oh, John's the dad, right? John's the father. Yeah, he's lost his mind. Matt Hagee's okay. John Hagee's lost his mind. I don't know if he fell in love with the money he was making or whatnot, but he's selling wolf tickets. There's some people on the internet that have got an internet following. They're selling wolf tickets. They've left their church because their church basically called them out on it, so they started a new church. I'm going off the cuff here, so I'm not going to name any more names. I'll write them down later, and I'll put it in a sermon so I can mark and avoid them. But there's plenty of people that have cult followings, and I mean cult followings in two senses of the word. One, they have a lot of people, and two, it's an occult. They are not Christian. Just because they say they're Christian, or just because they hold a Bible in their hand, or just because they sing a song that sounds Christian, don't make them Christian. What they do matters. What they say matters. And we need to pay close close attention. Mark and avoid. We need to the Bible tells us to try the spirits. But we've got a we got a big following in churches today that they'll just believe anything that comes out of somebody's mouth because they're holding the Bible in their hand. Judgment's coming. Judgment's coming. Some of these people are sadly mistaken. They're doing the devil's work. They teach and preach love, grace, mercy without teaching and preaching judgment of God's wrath. And if they're doing that, they're only given half the truth. And if you're given half the truth, you're given 100% lie. God is love. He is mercy. He is grace. He is long suffering towards us and that's why we haven't been consumed yet. But he is also a God of judgment and a God of wrath, and both are coming. But modern churches don't want to hear that because it's not the, the tickling of the ears. They're not getting their ears scratched and feel good. What good is it to feel good if you're going to go feeling good all the way to hell? I don't want you to go to hell. I don't want anybody to go to hell. I want people to go to heaven. I want people to know about Jesus and Jesus of the Bible, not the Jesus of the emotions. Jesus of the Bible. Verse 5, Apostle Paul puts a couple of other things together. Worthiness with suffering. If we're worthy, why do we suffer? Simply put, we're worthy because we do suffer. Because we suffer with Christ. Pick up your cross. We suffer the afflictions of this life along with the ridicule and the mockery. And let me tell you, it's growing and growing and growing. The hatred associated with being believers because we have the patience that goes along with our faith. 
and we should have that patience. Therefore, we continue that race that is to be run. Verse 6 shows something else that goes hand in hand. He says, right, it is, he says, a righteous thing and recompense tribulation concerning what God will do. It's a righteous thing. Recompense means to repay. Let me read verse 6 here from the Bible. It says, and know ye, oh, excuse me, let me make sure I'm on the right thing. Here we go. It says, seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. Recompense means to repay, so how can it be righteous to repay evil? It's not us that's repaying it. It's God Almighty. That's who's repaying it. I'm not repaying it. Because we're to repay nobody evil for evil. Not even our enemies. We're supposed to pray for our enemies. And do good to those who want to harm you. Heaping coals on them. That's what that does. But God's going to repay them. That should open some people's eyes right there. God is the righteous judge, and his word says it, because God requires righteousness. That's what he requires. He requires it from you and me. But thank God he doesn't require our righteousness. Because if he required our righteousness, we have nothing but filthy rags. We have the righteousness of Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God the Father, who bestowed that righteousness upon us when he died on the cross of Calvary. Amen. So we have his righteousness. That's how we're going to heaven. Not anything that we've done, not anything that we could do, but everything that Jesus did for us. So there's the righteousness of God bestowed upon us, and because of that righteousness, we know we won't be judged by God's wrath. But there are a lot of people that will be. Because the word says it. Who's God going to recompense or repay this tribulation to? Those who trouble us. That's what Paul says. Those who trouble you and I. Those who trouble the church. Remember last week I said, how long? How long, Lord, are you going to just watch this happen? He's got a day. He's got a time. And he's long-suffering. Because it's not his will that any should perish. That all should come to repentance. But there's going to be a time when time's up. And then there's the wrath of God. We're, we're talking about this in Revelation in, 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 in Bible study on Wednesdays. We're in chapter 8. We're getting ready to go to chapter 9. It is really getting good. Because now we're talking about the right hand of God pouring out the wrath. He doesn't tell you this just to be a scare tactic. He tells you this because it's the truth. And it's coming. If there's somebody troubling the church, pray for them. Tell them the truth. So that they can be born again. If they refuse, stand by. That's a term that we used to use in the military. I don't know if Ravens used it or not, but in the military I used to get mad at my soldiers, I tell my soldiers to do something, they wouldn't do something. I'm like, you're not going to do it. You're not going to do it. And they're like, sorry, sir. You're not going to. Stand by. That'd be my stand by. Because it's coming. And they knew what I meant. And it came. Those people who refuse to put their faith and trust in Jesus, they're, they're, they're refusing to obey the Holy Spirit. They're refusing to obey the gospel that has the power of salvation. Those people, for lack of a better word, I don't mean to make light of it, but they're cruising for a bruising. It's a bruising they're never going to get rid of. And then verse 7 gives us a pairing that should comfort us. Paul puts troubled and rest together. He's talking about us now. Are you troubled like so many others in the church are? I'm going to tell you, if you're a born-again Christian you're sharing your faith, you've probably been troubled a time or two. You might have even been cussed at. You might have been told to go somewhere. It's not reserved for you. I've been troubled. We face trials and tribulations because we are the saints, because we are the believers in Christ Jesus. Praise God. If you're not facing persecution, 
something wrong. Something's wrong. Persecution of the saints. We have the gouging out of righteousness and holiness in our society. Our very country. I harped on that last week. Paul says to rest with him and his companions. Rest with him and Silvanus and Timothy. We can rest together as believers. Why? With all this going on, with all this heinousness that's going on, and with this judgment that is just waiting in reserve for God to pour out with his right hand, with all that waiting, how can we rest? Because of verses 7 through 10. Verse 7 through 9 gives us insight to the punishment that is coming to those who have refused to believe. The ones that have refused to put their faith in Christ. There's going to be fire, vengeance, everlasting destruction. Those things go hand in hand for an unbeliever. Those things go hand in hand for an unbeliever. That's what awaits them. That should be terrifying. When? When is all this going to happen? When shall this be? Verse 10 tells us, When he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because of our testimony of among you is believed, in that day. That day is coming, and it's coming very, very soon. Soon. Jesus said soon. Now, what does soon mean? It means soon. <laughs> People are like, well, they've been, they've been saying that for 2,000 years. Amen. And the Bible tells us something about that, too. When they start saying stuff like that, that's what we need to be looking up. Soon means soon. I've told my kids soon a lot that wasn't soon to them. Like, when we leave soon, soon. When we're going to get there, soon. It'll be not long. I can just imagine us when we're praying, Lord, how long, how long, how long? He's soon. I said soon. He's got a day. Jesus is going to be glorified in us and to be admired. I love that word, admired, by all of us that believe. Admire means to wonder and marvel. To wonder and marvel at Jesus. We're going to marvel and wonder at Christ as he is glorified by all of us in that day. What a glorious day that's going to be. Why are we going to marvel and not just because we're in the presence of the Lord Jesus and he's radiant. We can't even look upon him because he's so bright. But I think you're going to look around you're going to see some people that you talked to in the past that you thought didn't listen. You're going to see some people in heaven and be by your side and be amongst the saints and be part of the body of believers with Christ Jesus in that day that you thought went in one ear and out the other when you spoke the gospel to them. And I'm going to marvel and wonder. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. The guy at the gas station. I failed, but maybe somebody else did. Thank you, Jesus. We're going to marvel and wonder at a lot of stuff. But being in the presence of the Lord is going to make us marvel and wonder how awesome is that going to be? People you thought might, that, that you thought gave up on you. Like, I don't want to listen to that guy anymore. I'm not listening to him anymore. I've had people tell me, I'm done with you. I've had people use that phrase, I'm done with you. I'm not done with you. Because you're still on my prayer list. Praise God. My question is this. We're talking about that day when, when Christ will be glorified in his saints, when he becomes admired by his saints. Why wait to glorify Christ? Why wait? Paul says he prays for them in Thessalonica that God would count them worthy of the calling and to fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith in power. I pray the same thing for believers today. For me, myself, selfishly, I pray for that. Lord, work your good pleasure through me. Help me to die daily and be more like you. Work through me. And oh, by the way, Lord, work through them. Work through the body of Christ. Lord, count us worthy of the high calling you've placed on us, and he has placed a high calling on each and every believer in Christ to fulfill his good pleasure. Not ours, his. 
so that the name of the Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified. Because these things that we just talked about tonight in First Thessalonians, excuse me, Second Thessalonians chapter one, these things we talked about going hand in hand, we should be walking hand in hand with Christ, reading and studying. Those things go hand in hand. Reading and study, prayer and studying, those go hand in hand. Performing the works of the saints, not to get into heaven, but because we are going to heaven, because we've already been redeemed, we are signed, sealed, and delivered. We're waiting for the day of redemption, but we are already sealed. Work. Not to get in, but because you're already in. Let's make sure that we're walking hand in hand. These things go hand in hand. We should be walking hand in hand with Christ and doing what his word tells us to do. All right. God bless you. Thank you for the message tonight, for listening to the message tonight. I'm going to ask uh, Brother Travis, will you dismiss us in prayer, please, sir? Father, we just come to you this evening thanking you for the message that you put on Brother Richie's heart, for the words that you've given us, Lord. Pray that we just go out to uh, the world this week just being a light for you and just living for you daily, Lord, putting you first, Lord. Pray that we just not be ashamed to give others the gospel, Lord. Just know that you're using us to plant a seed. I pray that you just guide each one of us as we go daily, Lord. And I pray that you just give us a desire to just read your word and, and study it, Lord. Not just to check a box, but Lord, but to, to grow our relationship with you. And I pray that you would just touch this church, be with each person on our prayer list, Lord. We've got so many. I pray that you just lift them up. So we can thank you for all you do. Y'all keep Brother Kevin in your prayers in the morning. He thinks that somebody ain't going to be there in the morning. I don't know about all that.